Hi, good morning. Um, uh, thanks for coming out on the last day early in the morning, so showing commitment. I like it. Uh, my name's Andy. Uh, I'm a technical lead uh, working on the Nectar Research Cloud for the um, Australian Research Data Commons. So I'm just, I wanted to show, I wanted to demonstrate this uh, project that we've been working on called Bumblebee. Um, Bumblebee's Nectar Research Cloud, we've sort of got a, a theme with our name, so that's where Bumblebee comes from. So it's a virtual desktop service that we built on OpenStack. Um, so first of all, I just want to give like a bit of an intro into ARDC. So the organization I work for, it's um, nationally funded through um, the Australian government. And this slide is, like I don't want to talk about all of this. Really just want to, want to highlight that um, ARDC sort of supports research. It's kind of like a really broad kind of focus on how they support research. Um, the research cloud really sits in this sort of purple box at the end here uh, with the research computing cloud. So, so that's kind of the space that we're playing in. Um, but I also wanted to highlight that um, the strategy for ARDC is really to provide the Australian researchers with a competitive advantage through data. So um, what we're, so the virtual desktop, it's, it's really a, it's a tool for researchers to be able to get really easy access to um, workflows and, and tools in, a, in an environment that they're, that they're comfortable with or um, stuff that they're used to, right? So this is a screenshot here from um, uh, Fedora Scientific with uh, Jupyter Notebook running. So these are the kind of tools that researchers really like to use and, and particularly Jupyter Notebooks, like it's got a really it's used across a whole range of disciplines. It's really useful. Um, but quite often, researchers struggle to install these tools themselves, right? So, so part of the reason for why we're doing virtual desktops is, is so that we can you know, avoid the complexity and overhead of infrastructure as a service kind of tools. Um, you know, researchers, uh, we've been operating a research cloud for uh, 12 years or so. We've been doing infrastructure as a service for We've been doing it quite well, been offering lots of services, but really one of the things that, that often came back from feedback was, you know, Horizon's kind of complex, right? There's a lot of things in there. It, it can be quite daunting, right? So a lot of users, they don't need that complexity. They don't need all that power. They just need something that they can use, right? They, they, know, some, they know the tools that they want. They just don't always have the means to get to it easily. Um, so we're able to package tools and workflows in a really convenient way. We're able to support users in a standard operating environment, which you know, makes support easier, um, helps them get, get started faster. Um, and a big one for research data is data sets can be huge, right? And it's, it's impractical to be able to move that data in many cases, right? So if we can bring you know, these environments that, that users need closer to the data, then that's a real win. Right, then they can be productive much quicker. Um, and, and we found that virtual desktops are really fantastic for training courses. So if you've got a whole room of people who are participating in a training course, you, know, you don't want to lose half an hour, an hour, just trying to set up their local environments because that's just wasted time. So especially for remote training courses, um, virtual desktop really is a, is a, a huge advantage for us. Um, so for our service, there's a couple of design decisions. Um, obviously, we wanted to make it as simple as possible. Um, we wanted the desktop to be available in the browser so users didn't have to install anything. They didn't have to configure anything. Um, we use Apache Guacamole for that. I think we've, we've heard of Guacamole here quite a lot. Um, so it's, um, it, it's a quite a useful tool, and I'll demo that later. Um, we've got... Uh, like with researchers, it's really important for us to have a, a process to make sure that users don't just sit on the resources and, and keep them for themselves. That can happen when they're not directly paying for it. Uh, so we built in an expiry process that, that means that those resources are reclaimed and they're available for the next person. Uh, we've done uh, boot from volume. So boot from volume allows us to uh, have a little bit more flexibility in, in um, the environment that we provide the users. Uh, so we've got 
instance and volume uh, are loosely coupled. So that, that'll become clear later in the demonstration, but it, it helps us to be able to, uh, if they're loosely coupled, we're able to manage them differently and there's some scenarios where that makes a lot of sense. Um, for us, uh, multi-availability zone support was essential because we're a federation of sites all over Australia. Uh, so we needed to support users, whether they're in Brisbane or Melbourne. Um, and no incoming connections was, uh, it was a security thing for us. We wanted to make sure that users couldn't shoot themselves in the foot or users who weren't necessarily, you know, admins. Um, we, do, we wanted to make sure that they had a good time but were safe doing it. So the only access through is through the guacamole kind of proxy. Uh, so we've got a few different desktop types. Um, we've, got, we've got some that are generic. So we've got CentOS, Ubuntu, and Rocky Linux uh, is a new one for us. They're quite generic. Uh, they're really for users who know what they want to do. They've got sort of custom things that they, they want to install. Um, the desktops all have root access, so they're able to sudo and install whatever they need. But we also support um, Fedora Scientific, uh, Geo Desktop and Neuro Desktop, and they are desktops that have some tools built in. So, Geo Desktop's got some geospatial types tools. Um, Neuro Desktop is uh, a, a really interesting one where uh, applications are streamed in via CVMFS. So, it's a really, really powerful, flexible way uh, to support users in a dynamic environment. Uh, Fedora Scientific is a it's a, an official spin of Fedora that includes a lot of scientific tools, so we found that's quite popular with researchers too. So when users come to our service uh, and create a desktop, we allocate them four CPUs and eight gig of RAM, so we're quite conservative here. Um, there's a good reason for that, and it's because we allow any Australian researcher to just log straight in, basically no questions asked. Well, we ask them a little bit about the research, but, but basically there's no approval process. So, so any Australian researcher can get in and get access. So we've tried to make the barrier of entry really, really low so that users can, you know, if they need this, they can get in straight away without having to wait for us to uh, you know, approve or, or gatekeep it. So, so we give them quite a modest amount, but we do support a boost functionality. So if you decide that you need more resource, then you can hit the boost button and it will double your CPU and RAM. So. That's also time limited. So there's a few things that we allow them, allow the users to do with their desktop. So when they first log in and launch their desktop, they're presented with these buttons. Um, shelving is like a shutdown thing. Um, I'll talk about that later. Uh, extend is to increase the time. If, you're, if your time runs out, you can, you can extend it at any time, keep going, uh, boost, delete. They, it's, you know, makes sense. Um, a little bit about the life cycle. So, from the start, when users create their desktop, um, they're, they're able to hit that boost button straight away. Boost, we allow them to do for seven days. And at the end of that process, if they haven't extended it, um, it'll just resize back down to the standard size. So that's, that's just a Nova resize, that function. So it's really flexible for us. Um, at any time, they can go and extend their desktop too, so they don't have to wait for the full time period. Anywhere within that sort of 14 days, they're able to come in here to extend if they know they want to use it a little bit longer. Um, but if they don't and it hits that 14 day time period, then it'll go into a shelved state. And so for us, the shelved state means that um, their instance is, is shut down and deleted, but the volume stays around. So that's kind of the advantage of decoupling the instance from the volume is it allows us to manage those resources sort of independently. Uh, and so if it's stuck in that shelf state, well, not stuck, if it's in the shelf state for 30 days, after that time period, we actually delete the volume and, and clean up. Um, this is what we tell users. We tell them that we've deleted it, but actually we archive the volume because we know that researchers like to come back and say, hey, I really needed that research thing I did like three months ago. Right, so, you know, we have a little, a little thing there. So, um, but if users opt to delete their own, then it does actually get deleted. So for access uh, in Australia, we've got the Australian Access Federation, which is a federation of, um, it's an identity federation. Uh, so m I think nearly all of the Australian universities and, and many of the research organisations are members of this. So it makes it really easy for us to support 
the whole kind of Australian research community because they're all part of this federation. So we're able to support them through OpenID Connect. Uh, and for us, we run Keycloak as our identity broker. Uh, it makes it really easy for them to get in. So, um, so how it works is uh, virtual desktop images, um, <coughs> we, we build them with Packer. Uh, and we use Ansible for provisioning those. Uh, we convert them to volume snapshots. Uh, and the snapshots are stored in each of the availability zones that we run in. Um, part of that is because cloning from snapshot is the fastest way that we can get that storage set up for them. Um, users, users manage their desktops via the Bumblebee web service, which I'll demonstrate very soon. Uh, and so as part of that process, when users create a desktop or resize it or delete it, uh, the Bumblebee web service will create an asynchronous job um, and it goes via a Redis database to a worker. And that worker will then call the OpenStack APIs and, and do all that kind of processing. Um, so it all happens asynchronously and the users get a nice little, um, nice little bar that shows them their progress as it goes. Um, so the volumes and instances, as I said, are managed by the asynchronous worker process. It does all the hard work for us, basically. Um, uh, the bootable volumes are cloned from the snapshots. Uh, I mentioned that already. Um, and then when the desktops come up, they're, uh, they're fed a cloud init config that provisions the user account and, and a few other things that are specific to them. Um, and then at the end of that process, there's a, there's a phone home system that basically calls a webhook within Bumblebee so that it knows that the instance is ready to go. Um, and then from there, users are given a, a big green button that says, you know, go to my desktop. Um, and that link will send them directly to a guacamole server that's based in their availability zone. So we try and push uh, as much of that stuff to the local site as we can to improve uh, latency. Uh, and then guacamole connects to the desktops and it uses RDP on the back end. So uh, we found RDP uh, provided by XRDP on the instance um, provides really good performance and allows us to do some really neat things like um, audio support as well, which is uh, not, all, not, not all that common, I think, in a lot of these virtual desktop services. Um, so a little bit about the architecture. So the user on the left-hand side there will connect through a load balancer to uh, the, the main web service. Uh, it's using MariaDB for its back-end storage. Uh, and you can see it uh, links to Redis where it connects to the Bumblebee worker that does the sort of asynchronous job stuff. Um, and the Bumblebee web service and worker, they both talk to the OpenStack API for you know, provisioning and querying status and, and that sort of thing. As you can see, that, that component there is, uh, we run it in Kubernetes, um, and we've got a Helm chart for the Bumblebee stuff. Uh, works quite well for us. And so this, this core component runs in our, uh, in our sort of main data center. Um, and then we've got the site component. So the site component, this is the part that we push out to each of the availability zones. So when users have their desktop and they're given the link to Guacamole, they'll come in through the load balancer and to the uh, Apache Guacamole cluster there. Um, that linked up there to MariaDB, that's actually a shared database between Guacamole and the Bumblebee web service. So that's, that's how it communicates through that database. Uh, and then it connects to the desktops there at the bottom. Um, so you can see that, that sort of red part there, that's running in OpenStack, uh, and we provision that with heat. We've got a couple of different um, uh, templates that, that sort of build this environment, and we've got like an A and a B set, so that sort of gives us the ability to kind of fail over or if we need to do upgrades and things like that, so that we don't have any, um, there's no outages or anything like that for the users. Uh, so demo time. Now, hopefully. So I pre-recorded this to make it easier, but I mean, I prefer an online demo, but. How's the Wi-Fi? Moderate. Moderate, yeah. I just had it running before, too. Yeah, that's a great idea. Oh, here we go. Once it loads, we'll be all right. Come on. Come on. Oh, yeah, here we go. Excellent. 
All right, so I've just hit the sign in button here. Uh, I'd already been signed in, so you didn't see the full OpenID Connect process. But um, so what I'm going to do is I'm straight in. I'm going to look at this uh, Ubuntu Jammy desktop here. We've just got a little bit of information, gives the users some idea about what's provided in the image. Um, and then I can choose my availability zone from here. Uh, I'm going to choose Monash in this case and hit the Create button. All right, so at this point, there's been a job sent to the worker, and the worker is starting to create the resources. Um, so that I hope you can see this, but basically what's happening here is I'm, I'm demonstrating. So you can see the bar, what the, what the status is of the desktop there. And then in here, we're looking at the Nova and Cinder lists, basically, for, for this, uh, this desktop. So the volume's created first, cloned from our golden snapshot, and then once that's finished, the Nova instance comes up, attaches the volume, um, and then it's gone to an active state. And so at this point, the instance is booting, uh, and then we're waiting for Cloud Init to do its thing. Uh, we're just looking at the, the logs here. So we, we've got Kibana set up. Uh, we all the logs stream into here so that we can kind of keep track of what's happening. So you can see the last status update there was the instance was active. Uh, and so Cloud Init's going to do its thing, and then at the end of that, that Cloud Init process, we'll get that uh, phone home back to the, the web service, and then it'll know that the, the desktop's ready to go. So uh, It's a pretty quick process, considering it's spinning up a whole VM. Um, it's, it's not too bad. I, I think it's, it's roughly around 60 seconds, depending on uh, the availability zone. Sometimes it'll be a little bit more, sometimes it'll be a little bit less, but... Um, our web designer thought it'd be great to have this little spinning bee, right, to distract you from the weight. Uh, it's really nice. All right, so the logs will show that it's come up. Yep, so you can see the phone home uh, was successful. So, so it's ready to go. So at this point, uh, you can see a little bit about the, the current size and things like that. But hit the green button. Uh, it opens up in a new tab. Uh, and then guacamole launches. Uh, so guacamole uh, is, it, we sort of loosely coupled the, the two components um, so that users don't have to necessarily go straight to the Bumblebee web service if they want to log in. They can go directly to their guacamole uh, server if they want to. And both of them have OpenID Connect, and because it's single sign-on, if you sign in in one, you can go straight in with the other. So, so that works quite well. So you can see, like, the desktop's quite responsive. Um, I mean, the latency between here and Australia is a bit rough, so it doesn't look quite as nice, but um, better than I expected. Uh, so we've got, you know, like Firefox. Um, we've got some standard tools in there. Um, and I think I just did a little demo to show that it's got um, how many cores and how much RAM's in there. So type NPROC there. It's a bit hard to see, isn't it? It's a little small, but that says four. Uh, and you've got eight gig of RAM. All right, so so the next thing I'll demonstrate here is um, the boost functionality. So uh, I'll close the tab. So we don't we don't need to log out of this or anything. We just I, I just close the tab. Uh, we can go back to here, the management page, um, and then I'll hit the boost button. You just get this nice little dialogue. I love the animations. It's really nice. Uh, and then we go through this sort of process again. So we'll get the, the bar there. So just doing an over resize um, makes it really easy with the volume because they're sort of, we can operate on them independently, but um, we're just going to do a resize and then uh, it doesn't take very long and then it will automatically do the verify resize, uh, reattaches the volume and, and then it's ready to go. And it's just got to wait, through, wait for the phone home process to happen again. So we have a phone home as part of like the, the last stage of the cloud init process. But then it also sets up a systemd service so that um, if the instance is rebooted in any way, it, it, cloud init's only really going to run when you first provision the instance. Um, so we set up a systemd service that always runs at the end of boot um, for any times that you do any other processes. So uh, we can see that there are eight vCPUs now, 16 gig of RAM. Uh, and then we can go straight in and we're back to where we were before. 
Unfortunately, we can't do live resize. Like I think that would be really nice if we could uh, dynamically uh, add the CPU and RAM, but I haven't been able to find a way that we can really support that in a practical way. Um, but I don't think our researchers mind too much at this stage. So yeah, eight CPU, 16 gig RAM. So uh, shelving is the is the last thing I'm going to demonstrate. And so as part of the shelving process, um, the the Nova instance will just basically just get shut down and, and destroyed, um, and then the volume will just stay around. So we can stay in that state, as I said, with the with the workflow, we can stay in that state for uh, up to 30 days before um, that gets cleaned up. So at any time during that period, the users can come back and and hit the unshelf button, uh, and they'll get their desktop back again. Uh, so we're just looking at the logs there. We can see. Uh, instructed Nova to delete the instance. So what happened in the terminal? Yep, so Nova instance is gone, volume's there sitting in an available state. And then it just takes a few seconds for the interface to catch up. There we go, so it's shelved. So yeah, at this point, uh, I think the demo, yeah, I hit the unshelve. Um, so this is going to another job on the worker queue. Um, it'll just create the Nova instance now. Uh, we should see that come up in a in a sec. Yeah, there it is. All right, so we're just waiting for the for the instance to boot now. This is active. So we're just waiting for the for the phone home. <coughs> All right, is this ready? So that's it. That's that's kind of the basic workflow of, of how the virtual desktop works. So we've. We deliberately tried to make it as, as easy as possible. Um, and I think it works quite well. So I just finished the demonstration by hitting the delete and then and then that's it. So at this point, users could create a different desktop. Uh, at, at this stage, we only allow them to have one. Um, in the future, that, that could change. But we find that one's probably enough for now. Um, it, it makes it a whole lot simpler, too. So. The worker is now just going through and cleaning up the resources. So it powers off. So if we go back at logs, logs, we'll see that it's yeah, instructed now to delete the instance. Um, and then once it's satisfied that part is done, it'll go and clean up the volume as well. <coughs> Yeah, deleting. So that's it. That's the that's the kind of whole workflow. Um, and log out. All right. So that's the end of the demo. Uh, so for future plans, uh, we intend to support Windows uh, later on in the year. Um, Windows has always been tricky for us because. We're a federation of multiple uh, organizations, and Windows licensing is um, 
really tricky in these scenarios, but we, we think we have a, a path forward and users are always asking for Windows support, so, uh, so we're looking forward to be able to, to provide that for them. Um, the, the, the actual code base did have some Windows support and we ripped it out thinking we're never gonna, we're never gonna be able to resolve this license thing, but it looks like we're gonna add it back in. Um, but I th the, the, whole, the whole platform is set up to support that, so it's gonna be quite easy for us to, to add that back in. Uh, I'm looking at creating a Docker Compose environment, so this project can be evaluated easier, because at the moment, uh, it is, there is quite a few moving parts and it is quite complex for anyone else to kind of take it and, and try it out, so to make that easier, I think, would be, um, would be a real bonus for anyone who wants to try it. Uh, we're looking at doing some Selenium integration testing. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, especially when you start talking about the, the OpenStack APIs and things like that, so we're hoping Selenium will help us get better confidence in the code uh, and our handling. Um, and, and you do occasionally get OpenStack failures, so you know, it, it's been surprising to me how, um, how little uh, failures we've had with this. Um, the OpenStack cloud, <laughs> We, we can have the occasional transient failure with uh, one particular site might be, um, they might have some sort of back-end issue or something like that. Um, how we handle those errors is, uh, could always be better. So as we're coming across these kind of strange scenarios, we're, we're building exceptions in the code to handle that better. Um, so the code is uh, under an Apache 2 license, so anybody who wants to try it, uh, you're more than welcome. Um, we've got a repository there for the, the main web service. Uh, there's one for specifically building the images. The images don't need a lot, but they do need RDP to be available, uh, and they do need to support cloud in it so that we can create the user account and sort of things like that. Uh, and we've got a Helm chart there for deploying it on Kubernetes. Um, so, so that's it. Uh, any questions? Two, two things. Did you want to use the mic, Greg? Better for the video, mate. Two things. Uh, is it all in one project, all of those instances and volumes? How, how, do, you, how do you handle that? Yeah, yeah. And obviously yes. you manage that on the back end. Yeah. And what's the actual uh, tech for archiving your volumes? Uh, so your first question, yeah, on our OpenStack Cloud, we do have a dedicated project for this. Um, it, it houses all of the instances and volumes and snapshots and, and all that sort of stuff. There's private networks and, and all sorts of stuff all in that volume, so it's nice and self-contained. Um, users, we, we deliberately didn't want users to have to have a Keystone account to, to use this service. We, we wanted to make it separate from that so it's easier for users to kind of get started. Um, so that's why we have sort of a separate user system and, um, and, and we manage all of those OpenStack resources ourselves and, and don't give users access to that. Um, what was your other question? The archiving the volumes, the you said after the 30 days you archive volumes, you don't actually delete them. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's just a standard kind of um, uh, image, image backup to Swift, basically. Yeah, right. Yeah. <clears throat> Chris? Hello. Copy and paste in and out of the guacamole session. This is a common pain point for our users. I'm wondering how you guide people through it. Uh, just works. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know there, there, is, there is some scenarios where it's, it's a bit funny. I know that the guys who developed the NeuroDesk desktop, um, they had issues, I don't know if it was around Firefox specifically, and mm -hmm. th there was something really strange, um, and they published some stuff on their help, in their help documentation. But, but generally, I find like pasting commands in and out of the terminal and things like that just works for me. Okay. Maybe I need to try a newer one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I should you. also say that um, Guacamole supports drag and drop of files as well, which is really yes. neat. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a pain point for us because Guacamole itself is running in a virtual machine that's not, like Guacamole is not running on the desktop itself. Right. And so you kind of got this, we've got this, uh, directory on the Guacamole servers that we can use for staging the files in and out, but it's, it's still a little bit cumbersome at this point. Like, I'd, I'd love to have 
maybe an NFS mounted directory for that. Mm -hmm. So all users' files get kind of put into a shared NFS across all the Guacamole servers, but we haven't done that yet. So okay. when the drag and drop in the Guacamole user interface, that's all going through your, all that traffic's going through your load balancer too, right? So uh, yes, it will be, yeah. If they do files which are too big, it can become a bit of a pain as well. Yeah, it can, yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my question, my, I had kind of two questions as well, which is how, do you have a limit on the number of times you let people extend? Uh, no, no. no. We, we did initially, um, and we found users found it frustrating. So. so my question to that, my related question to that is how do you handle patching of sort of long-lived instances? Uh, we, we don't at this stage. Well, we do have um, automatic uh, security upgrades. Okay, so set. you have like... Yeah, you have your, the automated upgrades. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So for like Ubuntu, you've got unattended yeah, upgrades yeah, yeah. and, you know, the CentOS has its own or whatever. So, so we, we do do that and we do encourage users to update if they can. Um, but we find that the desktops haven't really persisted super long term yet. I mean, the service has only been running probably about six months. Yeah. Um, so we haven't had any serious issues. Uh, except recently... Um, for the XRDP packages that we use, uh, the guy who's maintaining it on behalf of kind of um, uh, EPEL, the EPEL repo, they, they pushed one that broke it. Um, and then so some of our users, through the normal kind of um, security update process, got a new copy of RDP and then got locked out of their desktops. How do you find just, XRDP? Because we're using VNC at the moment. I quite like the idea of switching over because we do already support Windows yeah. using RDP. So Yeah, I found it's really good, much okay. better than VNC, yeah. I would like to try Spice. Like, I think there was a Spice in X11 thing, but I, I just couldn't get it to work. Yeah, yeah like it, it, it seemed amazing on paper, but yeah. 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 Also two questions. Uh, <laughs> I see it's funny that we have all two questions. The first one is uh, for uh, multi-user access. And some of the research, there's always that uh, it's not just me that there's the only one person that want to use, only use one, uh, one uh, virtual desktop to access for my current project or, for example, or different projects. So at that point, if I just deploy this uh, VDM, then in that case, I will be have access. But if we are in a group and so on, how is this supposed to work that another guy can also access this desktop? Yeah, we, we don't really support that. Um, and, and what we're doing is we're encouraging users who have those kind of scenarios, like if they want uh, more CPU, more disk, or mm -hmm. they want it to be multi-user and things like that, we're encouraging them to go down the path of getting onto our cloud. And we're going to support all of these desktop images as applications in our application catalog on our cloud. So the process is a little more complicated because then they do have to apply for a project with us and get quota allocated and things like that. But mm -hmm. if they want those more complex, if they've got more complex requirements, then uh, we're happy to help them through that path instead. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the second question will be about uh, some kind of a schedule support, you know? Because uh, sometimes uh, the most uh, big pain, pain points that most of the companies have is, for example, um, during uh, working time. So this desktop should only use to work on this time, and probably on weekends nobody is using it, and just mm. the resources is running out that could be probably increase the cost of energy and so on. So yeah, yeah. Is there any also plan about the schedule of these uh, VMs that you can also say, for example, on Wednesday I want to, uh, the server automatically uh, shut it down and on Monday, for example, at 8 a.m. it will be uh, really uh, before I... Yeah, there's nothing built in the platform, but uh, I mean, there, there'd be nothing stopping you from mm -hmm. being able to implement that kind of stuff at the OpenStack level if you wanted to. Uh, or, over OpenStack API. project called Blazor that does exactly what you're saying. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So there's, I'm sure there's options there. I mean, for, for us, we find researchers just work odd hours and everything, right? So there was no schedule that we'd be able to do. But yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. If you're interested in Blazor, we, we do a lot of work with, with working with it. So. Well, I think I'm way over time. But if you, if you want any, any more demos or anything like that, just come and grab me in the hallway. I'd be happy to chat. Um, but thanks for coming. <laughs>